Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Amen. And it is a happy day. And I don't even want to say more words because we have worship. We are engaging with the Lord this morning, and he is risen. So say hi to your neighbor. Let's greet each other in the name of the Lord and continue worshiping this morning. sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in, when death was arrested and my life began. was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested my life began oh your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithful he he canceled my
2 Timothy 1 9 says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Let's continue to sing this morning of the hope we have in Jesus and the victory in his name. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. Striving seas, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love. Righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ. the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine. you. You are our victory. No power of hell or darkness can separate us from your love. 
Jesus, we worship you. We praise you. Amen. You may be seated. to invite the ushers to come forward. Let's pray together. Father, you have given us much. And today in particular, we give you honor and glory that you made a plan and you sacrificed your son. And you suffered and died for us. We are grateful for all that you've done, for all that you are. And you've given us life and you've given us much. So, Lord, we cheerfully give you an offering and ask that you would multiply it for your kingdom, that many more people would know that you died for them as well. Lord, may your truth grow and spread through all nations, through all times. May you always be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can go ahead. So, Good morning. My name is Benji. I'm one of the pastors here at Timberline. And a few things I want to get on your calendar and get you thinking about. One is tomorrow is our monthly day of prayer and fasting. We do this every month on the first Monday of the month. So you are invited. I would encourage you to set aside some time tomorrow in particular. Fast a meal, fast all day, and spend rearrange your day to spend time in prayer, seeking God's face. Where is he calling you? Where is he calling us um, to seek him and what he is saying to us? In addition to that, we'll be meeting here. If you want to join a group of people to pray, they'll be here at 7 p.m. And if you would like the elders to pray over you for any in particular reason, um, the elders are available at 9. So that's tomorrow, the day of prayer and fasting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, elders are available at 8. Um, also, thinking far in the future, this summer, our baptism service is scheduled for the Sunday morning of July 11th. And that's at the Nafsiger's house. We'll have church at 9, and then we'll have a pig roast afterwards. So you want to make sure to get that on your calendar. This is one of the most exciting days of the year as people share their testimony and commit their lives to Christ. So that's July 11th. The rain date will be July 18th at the Nafsiger's um, this summer. Also, for all of you, this morning, when we are in between services, there will be donuts and coffee and milk and orange juice and everything out in the lobby. So hang, plan to hang around for a little bit if you would like and engage with some people. It's going to be an exciting morning of celebration. And uh, to continue the celebration, I'd like to ask the ushers to come back up. You guys can go ahead. This is our bucket offering. Aware of the fact that this is Easter around the world. So thinking of our village in Guatemala, we are paired with the village. We've been paired with them for over five years. <laughs> Um, and they are also celebrating Easter this morning. And every morsel that gets dropped in this bucket goes straight to Guatemala. Um, our tagline is we eat less so that, they can, so that others can eat, period. Um, so keep that in mind. Keep praying for our village as they continue to go through some difficult times. But know that the Lord is risen in Guatemala as well. continue to worship. Let's think about the victory we have in Jesus as we sing. Would you stand with us and sing? You are always fighting for us. Heaven's angels all around. My delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown. You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and
nothing higher, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. There's nothing stronger. for your victory. We praise you for the cross. Lord, we love you. We love worshiping you. Father, we're so grateful for your sacrifice, for your blood, for the power of your resurrection. Jesus, we praise you. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Timberline. It's great to see all of you here today. I was in the meeting before the meeting, and uh, somebody said, this is your last Easter. I like to think I'm dying or something. I'm not sure what that was all about. But anyway, it's great to have all of you here. My name's Marlon. I'm one of the pastors here. What is the problem with the world? I sent out this question last Wednesday, and my computer just kind of blew up after I did that, you know? Response after response is like, true, 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 you know, 47 in all. Yeah, I know it's not like millions, like when people blog and stuff, but any other time we ask for feedback or even when we give things away, we never, ever receive email responses like we did for this one. In fact, I received emails I didn't even recognize. I had to go into my contact to see who you were because I thought maybe I'd sent this question out to some random stranger or something. So, but regardless... I want to thank you for getting back to me, and here are the responses, and we just kind of divided them up into seven categories. So uh, the first uh, category was selfishness slash inward pride and uh, focus, inward focus and pride. And you can see a whole list. Maybe you see some of yours there, you know, concern about self, not others, only care about self-gratification, self initial self inward uh, focus. You can just kind of read down through them real quick. All kinds of responses related to selfishness, inward focus, and pride. The second area was lack of love, too much competition, comparison, and greed, not enough love, compassion, grace, and understanding, the inability to walk 
a mile in another person's shoes. It seems like people just don't care anymore. Love is gone. There's not enough love in the world because the greatest of faith, hope, and love is love. Third area was lack of personal responsibility. People waiting for everything to be given to them. No one wants to work anymore. Lack of personal responsibility for our actions. Spiritual attack to turn us into victims. Inability to acknowledge our own sin. Blaming others for our shortfalls. The resistance to individual growth and change. Fourth area. Not recognizing need for God. Not recognizing need for surrender. They try to be God of their lives instead of letting God be the God of their lives. Rejection of God. Don't know God. We have lost our moral compass and desperately need Jesus. No heart surrender to Christ, not acknowledge the true God. The word is unbelief. We fear each other and not the Lord. And then the next area was sin. And we got these responses, sin, 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 unrepented sin, human sin, especially worshiping ourselves. And then, of course, you can't can't miss this one. You always have to have politics, okay? So the next one was politics. Everyone having a different version of the truth, the absence of unity, the arrogance or lack of humility, Humility in man, the church condemning the world instead of living the kingdom. They need to see the gospel in us, the church. And then there were just some additional comments. God's timeline of prophetic events is being perfectly orchestrated, is perfectly on time. One of my online orders arrived a day late. It's a problem in the world, right, I guess? (laughs) A song comes to mind, when will the world see that that they need Jesus? Division, lack of unity. So what do you think? Did we get what the problem is in the world? Do you think we? We figured that one out. What was really kind of an open-ended, give me your opinion kind of a question. And I appreciate so much your response. And you had some really great answers. So I just want to say this. None of you were wrong. But I was looking for a specific answer. And I was just curious to see if anyone else was thinking the way that I was thinking. Two people hit it right on the head. In fact, you two were so spot on that I didn't list your answers because I didn't want to give it away. Um, But you probably noticed, two of you probably noticed that you were not involved in this lineup here. So what is the problem with the world? How many of you ever heard of the Canadian band called Down Here? How many of you ever heard of that? Wow, really? Well, you're going to hear about them this morning, so take a listen to this song. A secret evil corporation somewhere overseas They're pulling strings, arranging things It's a conspiracy Oh, what about the ones who shaped the course of history? What if we petition for one grand apology? I'll write to my prime minister You write your president Everybody's wondering how the world could get this way If God is good and how it could be filled with so much pain It's not the age-old mystery we made it out to be Joe Mystery with me. 
trust myself I dare not trust myself So I trust in someone else So what's the problem with the world? Well, come on, let's hear it. What's the problem with the world? We just don't like to say it, do we? It's just so hard to admit that. It's amazing. You know, it's, it's me. Two letters, one very small word, or as our two winners put it, they actually said, I am. Two people said, I am. Interesting. As the song says, the system isn't the problem. The devil isn't the problem. The forces of darkness aren't the problem. I am the problem because I am naturally prone to wander. Song goes on to say, I tend to hide the fact. I need a redeemer. I'm not trustworthy. The sooner I can admit it, the sooner I can sing along, the sooner I can sing along, the happier I'll be. So the happier we're going to be, the sooner we're able to just admit it's me. Here's what's intriguing to me. All of us know intellectually that we are the problem. Because we all sin, and we all know that we sin. You want me to prove it to you? If there's anyone here today who has never sinned, please stand up. I thought maybe somebody would have the guts to, but... If there is ever a thought that unites humanity, it is this. We all sin. If there's ever one thought that unites all of humanity, it's that we all sin. The problem is me. I have never met a perfect person. In fact, I've never, ever met a person who claims to be without sin. All the people I've ever talked to about the gospel, every conversation I've ever had, I've never had a person say, no, I don't sin. 1 John 1, 8 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And verse 10 says, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. I think this is one Bible verse that everyone agrees with. In fact, Every translation, every paraphrase that I read basically says the same thing. Why? Because we all know that we sin. The problem with the world is me. And the problem with me is that even though we admit we sin, we often have a way of believing that our sin isn't as bad or as offensive to God as the sin of others. And even though we sin and we know that we sin and we justify our behavior and we downplay the seriousness of it, we also take note of the sins of others and somehow make their sin bigger than our sin. So if, if we are the problem, now what? What do we do with our problem? If we are the problem, what does the Bible say about the problem? Did you know that the word problem isn't in the Bible? In spite of the fact that we use this word all the time, we talk about our problems, we talk about the world's problems, we say no problems, we say he's the problem, you're the problem, that's the problem, we check out problems, we solve problems, we diagnose problems, and yet it's not in the Bible at all. Check it out. Old Testament, New Testament, NIV, KJV, NASV, it's just not there. Did you know that? No, you didn't know that. I didn't know it either. It's just not there. But if you go to the message paraphrase, it's there. Okay? So Romans 8, 3 in the message paraphrase, God went for the juggler when he said to his own son, he didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. 
In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entering the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. So here we have the problem, and, and the message has maybe two or three references in the whole Bible that uses the word problem. There's not many. He didn't deal with the problem. So what's the problem? What's the problem that we're talking about in Romans chapter 8, verse 3? Well, if you go to the NIV, this is what it reads. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. So the problem, folks, is in the red. The problem is our sinful nature or our flesh or, our frailty, or the frailties of our human nature. However you want to say it, the problem is me. That's really it. The problem is me. So let's go back to the message paraphrase, if you would. You want to put that one there? Was the problem remote or unimportant? No. Who took on the problem? Jesus. How did he do it? He became the problem. Isn't that incredible? He became the problem along with us as struggling human beings. Why? To set things right. Now, if we just back up a couple of verses, we can get the big picture here in Romans chapter 8. So here you go, Romans 8, 1. With the arrival of Jesus the Messiah, that faithful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. So who took on the problem? Well, once again, it was Jesus. What did he do? He resolved it. How did he resolve it? Well, he freed us from the tyranny of sin and death. In other words, he freed us from ourselves because we are the problem. How did he do this? That's what we're going to talk about today. How did he do this? What is today? What's today? Sunday. I know it's Sunday. What is today? Easter. Say it again. What is today? Easter. Say it louder. Easter. Easter solves the problem of the world. It does. Easter solves the problem of the world. It solves your problem, my problem, everybody's problem. John chapter 12, verse 31 says, Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. This is what Jesus said. But I, when I am lifted from the earth, will draw all men to myself. This is the story, folks. This is the Easter story, and this is the good news. So go to your notes. We're going to talk about this briefly. Number one, the good news about the problem is that the devil couldn't hold him back. The devil couldn't hold him back. Did you ever try to hold somebody back that was bigger than you, stronger than you? It just doesn't go very well when you try that. We sang these words this morning. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices though heaven had lost. Kind of like they lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Now, what does the word arrested mean? Well, if you look it up, it means to seize or to stop someone with legal authority. It means you have the legal authority to stop or to seize someone and to take them into custody. That's what the word arrested means. So the devil couldn't hold him back through death. And the devil was arrested, or death was arrested, was stopped in the process. And what appeared to be his triumph, the devil's triumph, was actually his defeat. The devil thought he had it made. Now you think about that. The devil thought he had it made. He thought physical death would contain and crush the Son of God, but it didn't, and it couldn't. So I want you to look at Mark chapter six, verse six, Mark chapter sixteen, verse five. As they entered the tomb, 
They saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He has risen. The good news about the problem number two is Jesus rose from the dead. <clears throat> Jesus rose from the dead. And we sang these words, there in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he arose again. This is the Easter story. This is why Easter is so much more important than Christmas. It has always amazed me that Christmas in America is that Christians in America are so much more focused on Christmas than they are on Easter. I'm not really sure why. Probably because it gives us an excuse to spend money, and we just love to spend money. I don't know why else Christmas would be more important than Easter. But Easter doesn't stimulate the economy like Christmas does. I'm sure it stimulates it some, but probably not like Christmas. But Jesus never said, remember my birth. But he did say, remember my death. And that's why we gathered Friday night. He did say, remember that. And this is why the devil couldn't hold him back and he rose from the dead. Now, if you go on in the Mark passage, it says, don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? He kind of like, see this? See where he was, you know? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Go to your notes. The good news about the problem is that the tomb is empty. The good news about the problem is that the tomb is empty. Here's proof that the devil couldn't hold him. Here's proof that Jesus rose from the dead. Here's proof that Jesus conquered death. Dead men don't leave graves. The church that I used to pastor at had a graveyard. Never saw anybody leave the grave once they got in there. Dead people don't leave the grave. Yet Jesus left the tomb and left the door wide open. And this means that we will not need to fight our way out of the grave someday when he calls us home. He left the door open 2,000 years ago. And this is God's guarantee that even though we physically die, we never really die. We physically die, but we never really die. We sang these words together this morning. The greatest day in history, sin is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. Folks, this is Easter. And this is party time because the tomb is empty. Hallelujah. He is alive. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 says, Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Go to your, go to your uh, notes, if you would. Number four, the good news about the problem is death has lost its sting. Death has lost its sting. So, so I'm just wondering, how many of you here sometime in your life have been stung by a bee? Raise your hand. Probably most of us have sometime. Now, what is the highest number of bee stings any of you have ever experienced at one time? I've only had one. Who's had, who's had more than that? How many of you had? Anybody have over 30? Whoa. How did you look that day? A week in the hospital. It's amazing. It's amazing. I, I'm, I'm sure a bunch of you have, have experienced more than one. I've never experienced more than one. But, you know, bee stings hurt. <clears throat> and I don't know about you, but I have had many encounters with bees that I felt were totally unfair <laughs> and totally unprovoked. I was riding my motorcycle one time, coming off an exit. I was doing about 15 miles an hour. A bee hit my arm, went down to my shirt, stung me right in the chest. What did I do to that bee? You know, you could have heard the cycle coming. You could have got out of the way. <laughs> Walking through the yard one day, bee just come up, psh, psh, nailed me right in the chin, you know. Therefore, I just want you to know I have no sense of mercy when it comes to protecting bees. 
in my world, the enemy, good deeds of dead babes. Just want you to know that. Now, the Greek word for sting means to prick or to poison. That's what the word means, to prick or to poison. And this is what comes to mind when we think of death. It's painful. And it's lethal. And yet when Jesus rose from the dead and left the tomb empty, he took the sting out of death. That's what it says. He took the sting out of death. How in the world did that happen? So when I, when I think about that, I, I picture a bee with its stinger ripped out, and I love that thought. That just kind of makes my day. I would enjoy holding a bee that had its stinger ripped out, especially a big old bumblebee, fuzzy little thing. You can't do anything to me. You know, you can't get me back. Sting me when I'm riding my motorcycle. I'm not trying to cause you any harm. Now, death still happens doesn't say that death doesn't happen. It just says it takes the sting out of death. How is this possible? How can death not be filled with pain and poison? Here's how. And what I'm going to say right now, some of you aren't going to get. I'm just going to tell you. You're not going to get it, but try, okay? Something happened on the cross that changed the definition and the composition of death. Something happened on the cross that changed the definition and composition of death. Jesus conquered death. He ripped its stinger out and washed away our sin, our problem. Okay? And death for the Christian became the gateway to eternal life in heaven with Jesus. Now, this next verse that I'm going to share with you, some of you aren't going to get this and you're not going to like it, but here's what it says, Psalm 116, 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I told you, some of you just aren't going to like that at all. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but do you really believe that? I'm guessing most of you don't. Most of us don't. You know, if you don't, Believe this verse, you will never really experience true peace. You kind of have a, a halfway peace, a kind of peace. But if you don't get this verse, you don't understand what I'm saying, you're never going to really have true peace. This is a great truth in the midst of this pandemic. Death through coronavirus is an opportunity to see Jesus. I told you you weren't going to like this. Let me say it again. Death through coronavirus is an opportunity to see Jesus. And I'm not too sure that many of us really believe this. For myself, you know, I know it in my head. I don't always feel it in my feeler. But I'm trying to go from my head to my heart on this thing. We sing these words. We just sang them this morning. The cross has the final word. There's nothing past that. The cross has the final word. Evil may put up its strongest fight, but the cross has the final word. So do we believe that? Do we really, really believe that? You see, there's no need to fear death. <clears throat> there really isn't. There's no need, folks, to fear COVID. There's no need to fear accident, to fear cancer, to fear the loss of democracy. Yes, there's no need to fear that, folks. There's no need to fear the death of this nation. It will happen someday. There's no need to fear it. We have no need to fear, period. It's not because we're brave or because we're smart or because we're good or because we always do the noble thing or because we're right or because we're left. It's only because Jesus took the sting out of death. He kicked the fear of death and the power of death right in the pants and drop kick them into the grave of eternity. How many of you know what a drop kick is? Any of you play sports enough to know? I don't know what it is today, but when I played soccer, a drop kick was the ball went out of bounds, you know, and they didn't know who it went out on, and so the ref took the ball and dropped the ball, and two guys got the chance to kill each other and try to get the ball, you know. But you know, Jesus drop kicked death right into the grave for eternity. 
And this ability to face death with courage and grace depends solely on the Lord Jesus Christ. Solely. He's the only one who promised that if we would trust him, someday we will rise with him. And most of us here today, most of us, I believe, have staked our entire lives on this promise. And if it's not true, we're done. We're done. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God who gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. And that takes us to point number five. The good news about the problem is that victory is found through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory is found through our Lord Jesus Christ. We sang these words, every high thing must come down, every stronghold must be broken. You wear the victor's crown. I love those words. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome, you overcome. The really good news is this. If you're looking for Jesus today, you can meet him right now. There's probably some of you here today that don't really know Jesus. You know, maybe you're here, you've gone to church for years, maybe you know all about him, but you've never really met him. You know, for example, some of you have attended Timberline for years, and, and I would venture to say that there are individuals in this auditorium that you have never personally met. I'm guessing, probably. One or two people, maybe, maybe a handful of people. Maybe you know their name, you maybe you know their wife or their kids or even what they do for a living, but my guess is there are some right here in this room that you have never personally met and for certain you don't truly know them. So as we close on this wonderful Easter morning, may I introduce you to Jesus today. You know, he's the son of God who came down from heaven. He was sent here by his father to die on the cross for you to take care of the problem. He was buried in a tomb. He rose from the dead on Easter Sunday morning. And through his defiance of death, he paid for your sin. He paid for your problem. So that if you believe in him and trust him, you will never perish, but have eternal life in heaven. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Folks, Jesus is alive this morning standing with open arms and inviting you to accept his offer of eternal life. The door to heaven is wide open. And I invite you this morning, those of you that have never made that commitment, I invite you to take a step of faith and allow Jesus to prove to you that he can and will change your life forever. So what are you going to do with this invitation? The ball's in your court. While you think about this, I'd like to invite the worship team to come up. And we're going to sing these words together in just a moment. It goes like this. O hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. O God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. O Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. O God. You have done great things. So if you're here today and you don't have any confidence in your relationship with God, and if you're, to, and if you're here today and Easter is only a day for you to think about egg hunts and chocolate bunnies and disgusting sugar-filled peeps, <laughs> can you say amen to that? Amen. But anyway, if that's all Easter is to you today, then I implore you, I beg you to come to Jesus. I beg you to do that. Let this song speak to your heart. And there's going to be some of us right now today, they're going to pray that you will come to Jesus and that your life will change before the song ends. Let's stand together and sing great things.
this morning during that song, if you invited Jesus to change your heart, change your heart, this is how you will know if it's real. You're going to tell somebody about it. I'd love to hear about it. I'm sure there's other people who'd love to hear about it. But if you made that decision this morning, tell somebody about it. You don't need to be ashamed or afraid to do that. Let's bow our heads for the benediction. May the wonder of the risen Christ be ever in your thoughts and on your lips. May the sacrifices of our great Passover lamb protect you from death and give you life. May Christ, as the first fruits of the resurrection, renew your hope for eternal life in his kingdom. May your heart be filled and overflowing as you bring these things in close through the Easter story and treasure them in your heart. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace. And enjoy the snack in the cafe. <laughs>